Well, welcome to another Friday night. We've been doing this little series as part of our reparenting series on helping our children make healthy distinctions. So we use terms that sometimes they can be either healthy or unhealthy. It really depends on our motivation, how we do it. And so we need to make important distinctions to determine between healthy and unhealthy. And I've been going through a series of different topics that need careful distinctions for people in recovery so that their thinking is clear and they don't get themselves very confused and get into unhealthy behaviors. And so today I want to give you just a, a few more that I think are very important distinctions for people in their recovery journey. The first one is a very common one for many people, and that is beginning to distinguish between healthy working hard versus unhealthy perfectionism. So many people that come out of complex trauma end up being perfectionists. So if we go back to being in complex trauma, what many people were trained to do is that they had to do everything perfectly and that was driven by their shame and what happened with that was it began to be equated that doing everything perfectly was what it meant to work hard so if you didn't do it perfectly then you weren't working hard enough you were being lazy and so they drove themselves all the time until a job was just perfect and that was their norm. But now in recovery, what they find is if they don't do a job perfectly, then they feel guilty that they're being lazy, that they're sliding into avoid patterns. But by trying to do a job perfectly, it's starting to affect their ability to meet all of their responsibilities. It's causing them to obsess, it's causing them to burn themselves out, it's starting to affect their relationships negatively. And so, so this whole perfectionism, they're beginning to realize maybe there's something about it that I've got wrong in equating it with this is what hard work means. And so it becomes very important for them to begin to be able to distinguish between healthy hard work and unhealthy perfectionism. So let me say a few things about this perfectionism. Perfectionism in childhood, if it's equated with hard work, basically it mistrains your conscience. So now you feel that hard work must equal perfect work. And therefore, if your work isn't perfect, you feel guilty, but you haven't done anything wrong. It's just that your conscience was mistrained. And so part of recovery is retraining your conscience. But the second thing is to go back to this shame thing. Perfectionism is a solution that people, their brains propose to try to solve their shame. So their shame says, I don't feel good about myself. I don't like myself. I don't respect myself. And I'm pretty sure nobody else does. So if I could do everything perfectly, perfectly, then people would love me. People would respect me. People would meet my needs and want to be my friend and desire me. So being perfect is the solution to what their shame. That's what they think. And so they drive themselves to do everything perfect. But what they don't realize is that part of what happens inside a person with shame is not just a drive to try to compensate for their shame, but there's also this inner critic. And what happens with this inner critic is no matter how good you do something, it's never good enough. The inner critic always finds something wrong with it. So you're driving yourself to be perfect, but in your own mind, it's never good enough. It's always something is missing you're caught. You can't find the solution to it. And so part of the recovery journey is healing that shame that so that I don't need to be perfect to be accepted and respected. I can just accept myself and respect myself where I'm at. But more than that, it's retraining your conscience 
so that working hard doesn't mean I do it perfectly. Working hard means I do the best I can in fulfilling my responsibilities, all of my responsibilities within the allotted time I have. And if it's not quite perfect, that's okay. That's the best I can do. That's going to feel really weird at first. You're going to feel guilty, but it's as you begin to retrain yourself within a few months, it gets better and better and hard work becomes good enough, not perfectionism. Let me take you to a second distinction that is so important for many people in recovery, and that is getting your value from your body or your possessions versus taking care of your body and possessions in a healthy way. Let me explain. Many people that come out of complex trauma, as we said, have deep shame issues. They don't feel good enough internally. So as they look at themselves, they don't feel they have any in inherent value. That's why people don't want to connect with them in their mind. That's why people neglect them or abuse them, is they must not have any value. Therefore, the only way to get value in their mind is through externals. And so that is what I do, what I accomplish, what I have. And so for most children, it's what do I get validation for? That must mean that's where I have value because my parents just validated me for doing that, for having that, for looking that way. And so for many children with deep shame issues, all of their val value comes from what they got validated for. So it's their brains, their beauty, their body, their abilities, their hard work, their service, their position, all of those things become the source of what gives them value. But what happens with a child who lives in that world is they begin to find out that they really only get validated for doing that one thing, for being pretty, for getting good grades in school. They don't get noticed anywhere else. It's like they're invisible everywhere else. Their own value only comes from that one thing. And so they begin to go, does anybody really care about the rest of me? Does anybody care about the total of me? And that deepens their shame. And so they find themselves in this very empty place where their shame is growing they like getting the validation, but their shame is deepening. So there's this gap growing between I like the validation and I seek the validation. It's like a drug, but I feel a deeper and deeper emptiness and I must not be worth anything if I'm not doing this. And so for many people, then they're caught. They go, this is not the way to live. This is not solving my shame but yet I can't give up pursuing a beautiful body, pursuing getting money and position and all of those things, because that's the only time I get praise and validation, but yet it's empty, it, but, and they're caught. And so that what begins to happen for many in their teens, 20s, and even into their 30s, and it often leads to a midlife crisis for many. And so when people come into recovery, Hopefully, they're in a program where they begin to realize that their value is not based on externals, that they have internal value. Now, that's quite a jump for most to begin to get their head around, I have internal value. Um, but what happens as they begin to accept that is they start to heal that shame. They start to heal that not feeling good enough feeling, and then the emptiness starts to disappear. They start to feel better about themselves. It's a very, very positive thing. But what then do they do about taking care of their body? When all of their value came from having a pretty body, man, they were in the best shape. They never gained weight. They, they ate really, really well. 
So now if my, if my value isn't come from my body anymore because I know I have value even if I don't have a pretty body, does that mean I just let my body go? Does that mean I don't care about my body anymore? Or let's say they got their validation from having such a neat, beautiful house. Does that mean now they just let their house become a mess and never clean it and don't take care of it because they don't want to still get value from having a clean house because they know they have value from internal? No. And so this is the important distinction that needs to be made. It's now about motivation. So why do I care for my body now? Before it was because that's the only way I could get value or a sense of value. Now I want to care for my body because I want to be healthy. I want to take care of myself. I, it's not a matter of whether people are noticing it or not. It's because that's a healthy thing to do. Why do I take care of my house? Because it's a lot better to have a, a neat organized house than to have a chaotic house. So I'm not doing it for the validation. I'm doing it because this works best for me and it's healthy for me. Let me have you think about it a, a different way. In the past, when all your value came from your body or your house, the neatness of your house, if you gained a pound or a couple pounds, or if you got a wrinkle, that was devastating. That was the end of the world. Like you just would go into this depression and then you would go on this rigid diet exercise program because all your value was wrapped up in that. But now if you gain a pound or two, it's like not the end of the world. You go, do I need to pay attention to this or is this just the natural part of aging? All of those things, but it's not the end of the world anymore. If you have a messier house one day, it's not the end of the world now. If your neighbor drops in, it's not you. You don't go to deep shame and I must be a terrible person. It's like, yeah, I got a busy day. It, it's no big deal. I'm going to be cleaning up later. So there's a total difference now in how you respond to the things that used to cause you to think this is the end of the world and go to deep shame and guilt. So having said that, be very aware though, that if you're shifting to this internal sense of value and the thing that used to give you value, you're not depending on anymore, you can still get triggered. So if you do gain a pound or two, you are going to get your limbic brain triggered. You are going to go to that old place in your brain that, oh, I'm, nobody's going to love me now. I'm ugly. Um, nobody's going to desire me. And shame is going to start to want to take over. When that happens, de-escalate out of your limbic brain back to your cortex and remind yourself, hey, that's not what gives me value. That's not the end of the world. I am working on me, on the internal parts of me. I'm healing, I'm growing, I'm getting healthier. That's what matters. And that's going to continue to be my focus. And you coach yourself through that trigger. The next one I want to talk about is very common for many people based on their upbringing. And that is the difference between healthy self-validation and unhealthy pride. So many people growing up in complex trauma received little or no validation from their parents because the parents were afraid that if they said too many nice things about their kids, their kids might get a big head. And then what happened is if the child talked about their accomplishments, their parents minimized it or even shamed them for talking about those accomplishments and told them they were being proud. And that was bad. There was nothing worse in their family than the sin of pride. Um, and so a lot of people just didn't get validation or saw self-validation as wrong, as proud, as bad. But coming into recovery, what they begin to realize is 
Validation is a legitimate need that every child has. And if a child is not validated properly, that need is not met, it does tremendous damage. It begins to create deep shame issues within the child. It can create a hyper thirst in some children for validation. So they're constantly seeking validation and pats on the back. And then that can cause huge relationship problems. Then many learn in recovery that being proud of an accomplishment doesn't mean that you're proud. It's not necessarily a bad thing or a wrong thing. It's okay to be proud of an accomplishment. So how do we distinguish between healthy self-validation and unhealthy pride? So let me just give you a little bit about pride. A person coming from a place of pride talks about their accomplishments for the wrong reasons, whereas a person coming from a place of humility talks about their accomplishments for the right reasons. So pride, they talk about their accomplishments to try to fix their shame. I need to talk about my accomplishments to impress you with me so that you respect me more, so that you like me more. So it's all about trying to fix my shame I need you to validate me so that I can feel good about myself. Or a proud person is constantly trying to position themselves in relationships so that they feel superior to others. They need others to f be inferior to them to feel good about themselves. So again, they're trying to fix their shame by being superior to everybody. And so they're constantly talking about accomplishments to position themselves as superior to others. Or a proud person, they need the spotlight kept on them. They need to keep, remain the center of attention. So if somebody else is talking about their accomplishments, they might quickly say, yeah, sure, 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 validate them, but then switch the spotlight back to them. So sure, 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 yeah, but this is what I did. So they're constantly reorienting the spotlight from other people to themselves. And so it's, that's what pride is. So humility gets mistaught in many complex trauma families. If pride is thinking you're superior to everybody is what it's being taught, then humility, you need to think, see yourself as less than everybody is what is taught. But that's not the right definition of humility. That's actually a false pride. And so humility is not seeing myself as less than. It's not putting myself down. Humility is seeing myself as equal to everybody. It is seeing myself that my needs matter just as much as your needs. It's seeing myself that it's just as right for me to express myself and my emotions and my needs and my dreams and my accomplishment as it is for you because we're equal. I'm not superior. I'm not inferior. We are equal. And so a person with humility then, they will share accomplishments but it comes from a very different motivation. And so they will share accomplishment with a few close friends who they know are safe, who respect each other, and they share it to celebrate. It's not to put themselves as superior. It's not to make the other person jealous or to validate them or to respect them more. It's to celebrate an accomplishment. It's because they have a friend base, a friend support group, where we want to support and validate and encourage each other and mirror back to each other their significance, their value, their, their worth. And so they share within that close group of friends for the right reasons to enhance the health of that friendship and that group. So let me get, make this very practical. If I've accomplished something, so I've got this fresh accomplishment in my mind, I try to follow some guidelines. So basically three. So number one is, why do I want to share this accomplishment? What's my motive here? 
so immediately I have this accomplishment and I want to tell some people. So why? What's, what's my motive? Is it to have them impressed with me so that I feel superior to them? Or is it just to celebrate with those that love me and we have a close friendship? So what's my motive? Secondly, who needs to hear this? Do I broadcast it everywhere? Do I just tell a couple close friends? That's usually what I would do, but sometimes if I'm working with other people, I might share an accomplishment if I know they're struggling and wondering if all this work is worth it and they're getting discouraged. I might share it to encourage them. And so it comes from a place of love to help others so that they will feel hope and motivation. And then the third thing is, okay, I've shared it once with these people. How often do I keep sharing it? Is once enough? Usually. I don't need to keep reminding people of this accomplishment. And so there needs to be kind of the awareness that it's easy to start talking about it too much. And I don't want to fall into that. So it's okay to talk about accomplishments. That's not pride. That can come from genuine humility. We just need some helpful guidelines around that. Now there's another distinction that is so important to think through. And that is healthy encouragement versus unhealthy positivity. So let me explain it. Many growing up in complex trauma grew up in families where they only got negative criticism from their parents. Nothing they did was ever good enough. And so it was always their parents were pointing out their faults, their parents were telling them how bad they were, they were failure, just negative, negative, critical all the time. And they now in recovery look back and realize, wow, that really hurt me. That did a ton of damage. That created so much of a shame identity that I'm now trying to recover from. I don't want to repeat that in my children. The danger is they become to learn we need validation. We need encouragement. Those are legitimate needs. So many think, okay, the correct approach now to parenting is to only say positive stuff to my children, to tell them they're the best at everything all the time. I just want to encourage them, be positive, never ever be negative with them. But then they begin to notice something after a while. They use that approach, but then they don't like what they start seeing in their children because what they begin seeing in their children is their children walks around very proud. They think they're better than everybody. They think they can do no wrong. They have this real superiority complex and they go, oh, I don't like this kid. Or the child walks around entitled, like treat me like a king all the time. Never say anything negative. Never challenge me. Never, never say no to me. I am entitled to get my way all the time. And they go, oh, I'm creating a monster here. Or let's say their child is a terrible singer. They can't even carry a note. They're always off key, but yet you've told them all their life they're a wonderful singer. They're the best singer in the world. And now they want to pursue a singing career. They just think they're the greatest singer in the world. And you know, wow, I have set them up for a huge disappointment. They are going to have to face reality if they pursue this singing career. They're going to get told they're a terrible singer. This is not a career for them. And it's going to crush them. It's going to disillusion them. And so all of a sudden you realize, well, you're confused. What do I do in parenting? I don't want to be like my parents and negative, negative, negative. But I've tried this positive, 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 And that's got negative consequences as well. So let me put it this way. In complex trauma, your parents mirrored back to you a picture of yourself that was all negative. And so it was a distorted picture. What you're doing now is mirroring back to your children a picture that is all positive. But it's distorted too. Because no child is perfect. Every child has flaws. Every child is not the best at everything. And so the goal of parenting 
is to give back to my child an accurate picture of themselves. Not distorted negative, not distorted positive, but accurate. And so what you did in parenting was simply a swing of the pendulum from my parents gave me totally negative, so I'm going to swing the pendulum to give totally positive. Swinging the pendulum often ends up with the exact same negative consequences, just from a different place. And so the goal of parenting is an accurate picture being reflected back to my child of their strengths and their weaknesses. Having said that, let me say this. Make it your desire in mirroring back to your children an accurate picture that the environment for that picture is warm, loving, positive, encouraging. So that you are focusing on the child's positives more than you focus on their negatives. You're going to talk about their negatives. You're going to point those weaknesses out to them. But you're going to create an environment of respect and building up and focusing on the positives and helping them nurture those positives. That becomes so important in the development of a child. Okay, let's go on to another important distinction. And that is, I get asked often, what's the difference between healthy leadership and influence in relationships and groups versus an unhealthy controlling person, dominant leadership that has to control everything? So important to think about. Now, if you're not kind of in leadership, that this you might not feel applies to you, but think of it in terms of parenting. So you have a, a parent who's a healthy, positive influence, a leader in the home, versus the parent who's a dominant, controlling parent. What's the difference? So let me start with this. Children need a leader. So a child, a child can't meet their own needs. They don't know how the world works. So they need somebody to teach them to meet their needs. They can rely on somebody to guide them. That is just so important if they're going to survive. But they need a safe leader. They need a leader they can connect to. They need a leader who will provide them with love and meet their needs. And so if they have a safe leader who loves them and meets their needs, then they have this deep sense of safety and security. And that is so important to healthy childhood development. But in many complex trauma families, that's not the kind of leader children got in their parents. They got leaders who were, yes, in positions of authority, but they didn't use that to lead in healthy ways. They abused that position of authority. And now it was about them getting their own way. They were going to dominate everybody and get what they want and get the, their rules put into effect. It wasn't about what was best for everybody. It was about what was best for them. So as a result, the child didn't feel safe. The child didn't feel a sense of security. No, that kind of leader created a sense of insecurity and a constant fear. And that's the definition of complex trauma, is a person in leadership over a child who's abusing that position of power. So let me just take it a little bit further. What did that parent do in the abuse of their power in order to dominate and control everybody. Well, they had to diminish everybody. So they would put others down all the time, point out their flaws constantly. They would withhold love from them. They would be abusive physically, emotionally, verbally. They would make any problem everybody else's fault but their own. Everybody was seen as inferior, as something to be manipulated and used, not to be loved. They looked for weaknesses in others so they could exploit them. They constantly were trying to intimidate others and became kind of bullies. And they gaslit. 
They distorted the reality to people to get them to not accept reality, but their version of the, the reality. And so that was how they controlled people. That was how they dominated people. The abuse of power, it was all about getting what they wanted, not what was best for those under their authority. So what comes out of that is, to take it a little further, is that person in leadership who is, you can see, needs to be in control, is abusing their power, is actually driven by shame. And so to them, the solution to their shame is to be better than everybody, to be constantly in control, to get what they want, to be in a position of power where people have to look up to them. So that was the solution to their shame. But what came out of that was they now see everybody under them as a potential threat, as a rival, as somebody who might challenge their power, challenge their rule. But if this is a solution to their shame, they can never give up that position of power. And so they have to stay in control. They have to continue to dominate. And once they're kind of in that position of control, they're not content. So they got to keep reestablishing that they're superior, reestablishing their power, reestablishing that everybody else is inferior. It becomes a vicious cycle of reestablishing power, feeling good for a few days, getting insecure, seeing others as threats, got to reestablish it by putting others down, by doing stuff. And that becomes the vicious cycle of that kind of leadership. And so what comes out of that when people come into recovery is what is a healthy leader? They kind of think every leader is going to be like that. And they don't want to be like that. They lived under that. They saw the damage that did. And so there's a lot of confusion because they can't think of being in a position of power being used any other way. So this is where a distinction needs to be made. So what is a healthy leader? So they're still going to lead. They're still going to be in charge kind of over people, but they use their position of power not to get their own way, but to serve those under them, to figure out the needs of everybody, to figure out what is best for everybody. And then the decisions they make is not about what I want, it's about what's best for everybody. So the leader sees everybody under them as just as important as themselves. Their needs matter just as much as my own. And that leader is willing often to rethink a plan when they figure out, oh, okay, this isn't what's best for the group. And I'm going to rethink this plan, even though it's going to inconvenience me and I might have to make some sacrifices, but it's best for the group. That's healthy leadership. So let me go back to unhealthy leadership. Unhealthy leadership, basically, that dominant controller acts as a narcissist. They're trying to solve their shame by constant power, constant superiority, hoping it's going to get them the respect that they need. But here's what I want you to understand. It doesn't work. It seems to work for a while because people respect them because of their position initially, but then... The leader, because of their insecurity, has to be intimidating and all of that. And so people then begin to respect them more out of fear than because of who the person is. And so fear becomes the main cause of respect, is if I don't respect them, I'm going to be in trouble. But gradually what's happening internally to all those people under them is they're giving outward respect, but they're losing respect internally for that person. Because that person is cruel, bullying, not a nice person, not a healthy person. And so it begins to gradually backfire and break down. True leadership, it causes people to flourish. It causes people to get their needs met, to be able to grow, to reach their full potential. And so people who are under healthy leadership, they respect the leader, not out of fear, 
but out of love, out of that person has character, that person loves me. And so it's the right kind of respect that lasts. That dominant narcissistic control type leader, it always represses leader, people. So people don't flourish, people get repressed. And it always does damage to people. Whereas healthy leadership always leads to health in people. That unhealthy leader, bottom line, creates a complex trauma environment. If you come into recovery and you've grown up with unhealthy leadership and that's all you've known and now you're kind of beginning to understand healthy leadership and you keep growing in your recovery and you get to a place where people ask you to be a leader, that's going to cause some issues for you. So the first issue is probably, I don't think I can be a leader because I don't want to become that person. And so that's a healthy fear. And doesn't mean you shouldn't become a leader. It should mean you should go in with your eyes open. And that leads to the second thing is once you become a leader, what you're going to find is now you do have power. And what your brain will naturally go back to is that old template of how dad led. And and go, wow, I'm the boss now, I get what I want. And you can, without even realizing it, begin to abuse your power. And so that's where you have to be so cautious when you get into a leader pos leadership position that you just don't fall into the old template, but that you really work hard to become a healthy leader. And that's where you often need an, another healthy leader to mentor you and to help keep you accountable so you don't fall into those unhealthy patterns. Now this leads to another, it's kind of connected distinction that is important. And that is a lot of parents will say, what's the difference between enforcing consequences with a child that's healthy versus manipulating a child. So let's say, and so you tell the child, I want you to do this, clean your room, and the child doesn't want to do it. So if I make the child clean the room, is that manipulating them or is that unhealthy forcing them? And if I say to the child, if you don't clean your room, then this is going to be the consequence. Is that healthy or is that manipulating? So those are very important things to think through carefully. So let me begin with the child's brain is a limbic brain. The cortex hasn't developed very much yet. So they still operate out of that instant gratification if it makes me feel good center. So the challenge in parenting is if I let my child just operate out of their limbic brain, they're going to make a lot of decisions that are going to make them feel good right now, but are going to have long-term painful consequences. So I need to help train my child to think longer term, to do stuff that doesn't feel good now, but it's going to be really good later on. And so what a parent does is then creates boundaries and structure and rules for the child. You got to clean your room. You got to do your homework. You got to go to bed at a certain time. You got to do these certain things. You got to eat all these foods, not to be cruel, but because they're training their child. This is what a healthy life looks like. And if a child doesn't want to do that, then you have to be able to go, okay, now what do I do? There needs to be a consequence that if they don't do it, then this is going to be the consequence. And it needs to be something that's going to make the child go, oh, okay, maybe I better do that because this is less painful than the consequence. So you're training the child to think through consequences and to choose what is healthy. That is such a challenging part of parenting. So you don't want the consequence to be abusive. You want it to be something that causes the child to say, I want to go to healthy. So isn't that manipulation? So help me, let me help you think this through. That healthy consequence option, you're still giving the child the option of choosing. You can choose to do your chores or you can choose this consequence. It's up to you. I'm not going to force you, but I'm going to implement the consequence. And so I'm not going to take away your freedom to choose. 
I am just presenting an accurate picture of life. Here's the choices. And if you don't make a healthy choice, it's always going to result in a negative consequence. And I'm just trying to help you think that through. Manipulation. I try to take away your ability to choose. Manipulation is very coercive. But more than that, manipulation isn't what's about what's healthy. Manipulation is what's best for me. So manipulation would be to a child, I want you to go steal money. I want you to go and do something wrong. And I'm going to pressure you to do that, not because it's healthy, because I want it. So manipulation is about dragging a person from a healthy place to an unhealthy place. Or just getting them to do what I want and not concerned about what's best for them or what they want. So manipulation is self-serving and it takes people often to a very unhealthy place where healthy leadership that has consequences is all about what's healthy. It's all about respecting a person's ability to choose. So another way to say that, love, the focus of love is I want a healthy life. I want a person to be free to choose. And so I am going to lay out for them healthy consequences, natural consequences. The focus of manipulation is getting my way and often doing what is unhealthy. Totally different. Let me give you one more distinction today. Healthy evolving versus unhealthy evolving. So for many people in complex trauma, life was about evolving, but it wasn't healthy. So due to shame, you didn't like who you were because nobody wanted to connect with you. Everybody was negative towards you. You were being abused and neglected and you decided I must be bad. I'm not good enough. I don't like me. I'm not happy. So what came out of that? If I'm going to be happy, if people are going to like me and want to connect with me, then I must evolve and become something different than I am. I must do what kind of everybody else is doing, what is popular, what is considered successful. So I need to evolve to become something different than I am. So what did people do? They started talking differently, walking differently, dressing differently, trying to fit in with that new group of kids, trying to learn some new skill so that they would fit in. But they were always becoming something different to try to get the love and respect and their needs met that they didn't get from being themselves. That seemed to work a little bit. They might have got fit in, but they began to realize it didn't really work. It was always conditional still. But more than that, there's a couple of other dynamics that were at work. They always felt like an imposter. They had that imposter syndrome. They felt like I'm not being me. I'm being fake. Everybody must see it. And it just fed more into their shame and more into their guilt. And so it, it just, they felt terrible inside empty inside. This isn't truly working inside. They weren't satisfied. And so all they were trying to do to fix their shame wasn't actually fixing their shame. It was feeding it even more. And that's the sad conclusion about that approach to life. But that was the only thing that many had as an option to try to survive in a family where they weren't accepted and loved and valued and their needs weren't met. But now in recovery, what they're finding is they have this deep longing to get healthy. And that means they have to evolve. They have to change. They have to try new things. They have to use new tools. They have to move out of their comfort zone. They have to do things that feel very weird to them. And all of a sudden they go, this feels like childhood. This feels like I'm being fake again. This feels like I'm trying to evolve into something that I'm not. Am I being an imposter again? And it stirs up all of that stuff inside of them again. So here's what I want you to see. 
The key difference is that the child was evolving to try to be something other than their authentic self because they concluded their authentic self was bad and it only caused them pain. Now you are evolving to try to become your authentic self to figure out who you are, to heal that wounded part of you, to grow and become a more healthy, authentic person. So one was evolving to be something other than what you really are. The other is evolving to become who you really are. They feel the same, but they're totally different. Let me give you a final distinction. Healthy healing of emotions versus unhealthy stuffed repressed emotions. Let me explain it. In complex trauma, since people couldn't resolve painful emotions, you just stuff them down. Because if I can't resolve them, I can't live with this pain constantly. So let's push them down or disconnect from them, stuff them. I just, I can't deal with it. And so they disconnected from their emotional world. And what came out of that was they felt just dead inside, robotic. There was an emptiness that developed from all of that emotional disconnection. And so what do people begin to do? They begin to try to find emotional life or to feel alive. And so the only way they know to do that is not through feeling emotions, but by pursuing thrills by pursuing excitement, by pursuing pleasure. That's their only option to try to feel alive. But then you come into recovery and you begin to realize that emotions aren't this bad thing that have to be repressed, that emotions are actually a beautiful thing that add beauty to life, that fill life, that make us more human, and they can be resolved so that we have mainly positive emotions, but and we can deal with the negative emotions. And so many people in recovery begin this journey of starting to explore their emotional world, this new part of themselves. But often what happens is initially, as they begin to explore these emotions and let themselves feel emotions and express emotions, they just feel like a hot mess. They've got so many emotions, it's overwhelming. And then they find they get triggered all the time. And that makes them even more of a hot mess because they are just going from one intense emotion to another, depending on the trigger. But gradually in this recovery journey, they begin to learn how to manage these emotions, how to express them appropriately, how to heal the wounds that cause the triggers to happen. And as they do this healing, growing journey, they find that they're not a hot mess. They're emotionally stable. They acknowledge emotions, manage emotions well. They're not all over the map. They're dealing with things and they're not getting triggered as much because wounds are healing. And when they get triggered, they, they don't emotionally dysregulate. They're able to, to manage it very well. And so what can begin to happen to people when they're not a hot mess all the time and, and they're managing emotions and not feeling these emotions at great intensity all the time because they're dealing with them as they come up is they go, hmm, am I stuffing again? Am I going back to unhealthy stuff again? Am I disconnecting again? Because I'm not feeling the same emotional intensity and, and I'm not all a hot mess all the time. So maybe I'm starting to stuff again. It feels the same, but it's totally different. What you are doing is such an important, healthy thing. You are now experiencing your emotions. You're not denying or repressing them. You're experiencing them, but you're dealing with them and you're dealing them with them with healthy tools. And the more you deal with them, the better you get at it. So it feels like that old disconnection stuffing thing, but man, it's a totally different thing. And I hope you see that. Well, that's another set of distinctions. We're going to have another week on this. 
I just hope it's been helpful to you as you think through the important parts of this recovery journey. So that's the end of our Friday night. Thank you for being here. I hope you have a great weekend.